Hello everyone and welcome to the NDTV WEF debate right here in Davos. This is one of the features here at Davos. We try and take a look at whatever issues there are that are really concerning India in particular and India's place in the world. And our theme today is going to be India's turn to transform. And transform specifically in this case, we're going to be focusing not just on growth and growth rates, although those will come up, but specifically the current steps that are being taken against black money, against corruption, and specifically demonetization, that banning of high value currency notes that took place three, four months ago has had a major impact. And the jury is out. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it a wonderful idea, but not implemented correctly? Was it as good as it could have been? Was it not necessarily the greatest of idea? So on this particular panel, we're going to take a look, A, at what India has just done and its implications. And because we're here at Davos, we're going to be getting a lot of global advice and expertise and some of the top experts in the field giving us suggestions on what could have been done better and what can still be done to ease any residual pain there is. And then we want to move on to something else, which is perhaps an even more important question. The stock of black money is all very well, but what happens to the flow? How do we prevent corruption in the future? How do we prevent the further generation of black money from coming in. And that's something that, again, we want to take lots of advice. I will be taking questions from the great audience that we have out here as well. And you can be sending us questions on social media. You can tweet us with hashtag NDTV uh, and you know, hashtag WEF, and we'll be taking all of that as we go forward. Let me start now by, by welcoming the panel that we have. Nirmala Sitaraman, Minister of State for Commerce and Industry of India. Thank you so much for being with us. Somebody who's been dealing with the entire aftermath of, of, of what's happened with, with, with cash. We have Kenneth Rogoff here, who's famously written a book called The Curse of Cash. So I guess the Indian government could always say all they were doing was taking your advice, although I know you have said, <laughs> although I know you have said they didn't exactly follow your playbook. And we'll get exactly. you to tell us why. So, okay. So it's not all your fault, is, is what I think you're trying to say, Kenneth. Right. Um, Arundhati, Arundhati Bhattacharya, the chairman of uh, the State Bank of India, India's largest bank, and again, has had to deal with all those long queues, which are now starting to, to diminish a little bit. Uh, but we'll get your, your sense and your perspective of it. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have with us Federico Struzenegger, who's the uh, governor of the Central Bank of Argentina and a young global leader. Somebody who's also thinking about something very similar in Argentina. Uh, and we want to get your sense of what lessons you may or may not have learned from India. And if you're doing it, would you be doing it slightly, slightly differently? And uh, Carmen Reinhardt uh, is a professor of uh, the international financial system at the, Ken at the Harvard Kennedy School. Written a book also, or a couple of books, I think, with, with Ken Rogoff. So we have a large, large Harvard contingent out here. You were also at Harvard once upon a time. So large Harvard, Harvard contingent out here. You will perhaps will be helping us with some of the theory and how we can put all this into practice. Maybe if I could get a minute each from, from all of you, and then we'll go into a freewheeling uh, discussion on this. Um, Nirmaji, why don't I start off with you? Here at Davos, everyone would be asking this question. Look, here you had India chugging along really nicely, the fastest growing economy in the world. And suddenly you decide to take a step. And uh, as for the IMF, again, we're no longer the fastest growing economy. We're now just left behind China. It will recover, no doubt, within a, a week or a month. But why did the government feel it was necessary to do this? Well, it was part of our electoral promise. And uh, even uh, soon after coming into power in May 2014, we started doing a lot of things which were till then not even touched in spite of a Supreme Court order. And if steps were to be followed, we followed it up with many other steps which were necessary, like coming up with an income disclosure scheme which ended as of the September 30th, 2016, where been, whereby people were asked to declare uh, non-tax paid assets, assets which were otherwise kept away from the system. <coughs> Besides that, we've also been negotiating with countries where Indians have kept accounts abroad, where non-tax paid money or assets had been created. We wanted the information to be shared Agreements have been signed. Double taxation avoidance treaty, which was becoming a big uh, issue because uh, a lot of investments were happen happening in India. You, I do not know if that expression is common outside. We call it as round tripping of cash. Indian money going outside and coming back as fresh investment back into India. 
neither paying tax in India nor paying tax in the host country from where they were coming. So these were issues one after the other the government has done in the last two and a half years. Uh, other than, of course, bringing uh, such laws which would very clearly not entertain uh, holding of assets which are not publicly tax paid and declared. Now, this step of demonetization was absolutely necessary because we are talking of an emerging economy. We are talking of a country which could send, uh, you know, Mangalayan to the uh, Mars. We were doing a fantastic lot of research, but yet 87% of our economy was in the informal, only cash-driven segment. And if, when I say only cash-driven segment, these transactions were not even getting captured anywhere. The money wouldn't go to banks, the money wouldn't come out of banks, the transactions were not getting recorded anywhere, and as a result of which, the number of people who were paying tax as per the existing uh, budgetary announcements was very, very small. In fact, this is a famous statistics which we quote, keep quoting nowadays. Only about 50 lakh people say that they earn over 10 lakh of rupees annually and therefore are subject to some kind of a tax. All others who file the returns, file their returns but pay no tax. Can a country which is aspiring to grow uh, manifold in research, in innovation, in bringing newer technologies on the one hand, and on the other, which has a bulk of population which still needs a lot of entitlements to be provided to them. Can we survive if this is the kind of tax to GDP ratio continues? And the two denominations of currencies which were made no longer legal tender, the 500,000, in value terms, constituted 87% of the entire currency floating in the country. We had to do it, we owed it to the country, and we don't right. regret it. You owed it to the country and you don't, don't regret Absolutely it? Absolutely not. It was required and we took a bold step. And it is, uh, let me, uh, even if, if it sounds a bit propagandist, I'll say this. You need a leadership which has the courage and the vision to do it, and also the stamina to stick with it to say that it is for the good of the country, maybe long term, short term, yes, you may have pain. We are willing to redress the pain as soon as possible. But I'm sorry, we have to do it. All right, we'll come back and, and, and discuss a lot, of, a lot of what you have uh, said. But let me just get opening comments from everybody else. And Kenneth Rokoff, so in, in, curse of, in the curse of cash, and you, you were really addressing it more to the United States. You were addressing advanced it more to countries. advanced countries. But you were pointing out that high denomination notes, such as a $100 bill, are essentially used more in the underground economy. It's not used by the vast majority of Americans, which is why you said it needs to be done away with. So to that extent, you were echoing part of what, part of what she said. What was your sense, though, of overall what happened in India and why you think it, it, it deviated from your playbook? I want to underscore some things the minister said that the... Uh, Modi governments had a broad array of measures at trying to deal with the black economy, trying to deal with tax evasion. Uh, my book's about advanced countries. It doesn't, you know, it sort of says, I, do, I don't see doing this yet in developing economies, but it actually talks about some of the policies India did that were very clever, for example, uh, requiring, uh, in many cases, licenses to be paid online instead of in cash which, um, you know, the whole idea of the license, Raj, and everything, it was a brilliant, very simple, brilliant idea, and there were many things. Um, on the demonetization, uh, I think the, certainly the um, idea behind it was good. Uh, what they were trying to do of address black money, terrorism, crime, is, is hard to argue with. I would uh, say some of the tactics I w if I had been asked, I might have said to do differently. Um, first of all, uh, there are people who recommended doing it overnight. I point to someone uh, in the 70s, but I, I, had, I say five to seven years is better, very, like the Euro system did, in order to avoid collateral damage. Um, a second point is one could question, and I just didn't look at the evidence. I have India treated in my book, but of course the largest bill was about $15, and uh, you know, is that worth doing? 
and if you're doing that one, should you also have done the 500 ruble note? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been presented with everything, but it's smaller than my threshold. Probably the single biggest thing is this question of how much do you want to capture the black money, stand there ready to arrest them if they can't you know, say what they did with it, versus avoid collateral damage in the economy. And uh, I think a big problem is that almost nobody knows this, but it actually takes time to print currency. You think, I've just run it through a Xerox machine. Actually, these machines are like rocket science. It's very complicated. Six to 12 months, also in Europe, everywhere. And so you need the new currency printed before you replace the old currency. And I think that, that was the single biggest problem uh, that they had. But you know, I, I, I do think um, it's going to take years to see what the long run effect will be. Right. Imagine before I come to the others, maybe I can get a quick reaction. So a, Kenneth had said that it, his preference would be to do it over a longer period. And I understand the reason you didn't do that was because you wanted to catch the people with black money unaware, which you couldn't have done. But the other point that he made about printing the notes in advance, and that is a question I've asked you and many others in the past, it was theoretically possible to have printed 500 rupee notes weeks, months in advance, had a stock of 600, you know, 6 lakh uh, crores of new notes printed in a warehouse somewhere. Say it's a new design that we are coming up with, print the series, and then after demonetization, you could remonetize really fast. Why is it that the government never did that? No, I appreciate this uh, observation and uh, all things being equal, yes, we could have done that. But then, the same argument holds good here too. Indians are very sharp in these sort of things. They would have smelt it, saying, oh my God, it's being printed. It's being printed. You don't do it for fancy. There's something coming. Much before you would have imagined, people would have stashed. Well, so have I think our, run on all scores, we have to keep factoring the brilliant Indian mind. <laughs> well, you know, theoretically, theoretically, just to play devil's advocate in this, theoretically, you could have run a children's design competition and say, new 500 rupee note to be designed, and say it's going to be a pink note with a mangalyan on the back. So when you're printing it, people would have said, yeah, we know they're printing it. They wouldn't necessarily have anticipated demonetization. I'm not printing No matter how it. smart they are. Vikram, I'm not going to be holding a philatelic competition for children. I'm printing rupees. I'm printing. No, I'm just saying how you could have got money. over the secrecy question. Well, that's one way of getting over the secrecy question. That's the only limited point. Okay, um, Arundhati, the basic philosophy of what was done, and having had a rather harrowing three months uh, in retrospect, are there things that you think a the government could have done differently, the Reserve Bank of India could have done differently, or banks like yours could have done differently? Well, uh, starting with banks like ours, I don't really think we could have done anything differently. I think we put our best foot forward and really fought it out uh, from the trenches almost, so to speak. Uh, regarding the Reserve Bank, I think uh, what has been said earlier and in many other forums that probably more communication would have been good. Uh, because as you know, when uh, there is a situation that people don't understand, there's a lot of angst, there is anxiety, there is fear. And it's important to have official communication in order to sort of uh, assuage people's uh, fears and to ensure that you know, things go, don't go out of control. In fact, I personally have done a lot of communication mainly in order to give that sense of uh, comfort to people that uh, things will work out and it's a matter of time only. Uh, regarding the government, I think the only thing uh, that uh, probably they should have done is to have more uh, stock of new notes printed before this whole thing came in. Uh, the minister has already said why that was not possible. So that's for anybody to accept or not accept. But probably that is one uh, area where you know, things could have been better. But having said that, you know, if I can just add that uh, what was amazing was this 1.3 billion people strong country. 86% of the cash that you had suddenly goes out of the system. And you have these huge crowds in every single bank outlet. But in spite of all of that, not one riot, not one loss of life through rioting or law and order situations. There could have been some people who fainted in the lines or even lost their lives on account of very many other things, but that could have happened in any situation. But the fact that nobody in the country actually took law and order in their hands in the face of such a huge situation, and 
also, you know, this was the first time being a very large bank, I am used to receiving at least a dozen uh, complaints of misbehavior every day. This was one period when I didn't receive a single, a single complaint of misbehavior throughout this entire period. So, you know, there was a lot of, uh, what should I say, a popular uh, feeling of support for the step that has been taken. And obviously, you know, people who were serving them, that is our employees as well, they were sort of, you know, it became a kind of doing a kind of national duty almost. So it was a very different feeling and I do not really know how that came about, but probably there is a feeling that not enough is being done in order to ensure that the gains of prosperity is being given to all. And this was seen as one of those steps that would be required for that kind of a thing. So psychologically, people put up with hardship because That's they right. thought this was a decisive blow against right. the fat cats and the others who were... That's so in a sense, it was almost like standing in the line and signaling that same protest that we've been talking about so That's much right. here in Davos, that this is the way that, that the people with ill-gotten gains are going to get it in the neck. And I think it's very important. You know, one of these um, uh, surveys in India said that 58% of India's wealth is concentrated in 1% of its people. So you can imagine the, the division between the haves and the have-nots. And that, when it keeps getting wider, it's going to result in a lot of pushback. And these sort of steps probably answer uh, those people to the extent that, yes, something is being done in order to ensure that that the gap doesn't so widen So you would further. probably have the clearest finger on the pulse of the situation on the ground. Would you say things are 90% back to normal, 80% back to normal? What sort of cues are you hearing about? What sort of stress levels are your bank officials under now? Cues are now a, a thing of the past in metro, urban, semi-urban areas. They're still there in rural areas, mainly because in the rural areas, there are many more people to be served and less people to serve them because our branches in the rural areas are typically small branches manned with very few people. Uh, Turnover-wise, I would say people are up to 92, 93% of where they were before the demonetization. So about 92% is where I would put it. Uh, what the problem really is, is that in many small businesses that were avoiding taxes, they were doing legal business, but they were not really paying taxes because they were not reporting their revenues. For them, they feel that some of their business models may have become unviable because their margins were so thin that they feel that once they become, they become included in the regular system, in the official system, then their margins will not uh, give them the ability to carry that on. Now, these businesses are literally uh, reimagining their business case and the business model. Yeah. So I think this is one area where we will have uh, some time lag before they come back in and start operating. But it. I guess when it comes to those businesses, if somebody has been evading tax all this time or making a business model by not paying tax, I guess the government and the minister would say, well, That's too it. bad, you know, you should That's have been, it. Actually, you should it have been paying to happen. tax. It, to, it had, had to happen. happen. You know, one other thing that is not generally known is that the cash intensity in the Indian economy has been going up tremendously. If you look at a bank like ours, we were giving cash to the extent of 3.4 billion rupees per day in 2013-14. In early months of this year, that had gone up to 6.9 billion per day. So from 3.4 to 6.9 in a matter yeah. of three years. And if you look at cash with public, in the last two years, cash with public had gone up enormously. Not only that, in 2006, the higher denomination notes comprised only 46%. From 2006 to 2016, in 10 years' time, it had come from 46 to 86 percent. Could also so, be you know, partly the, the effect of inflation. Had immense, absolutely. Dimitri, before I come to, to Frederica, um, I think you would also, you know, probably uh, the Prime Minister said it in his last speech, applaud the, the resilience of the Indian people, that they actually, you know, this entire period, two month, three month period of what must have been an intense amount of hardship for many people done in surprisingly good grace. Not just that there were no riots. There was, you talk to people in the queues, they said, well, all right, we are there, there's hardship, but I'm, it's, it's probably all for the best for the future. So I, I guess you would be joining Absolutely. the Prime Minister and applauding the Absolutely. people. Absolutely. No part of the country, because all of us, ministers, MPs, were moving around to different parts of the country to understand and take the feedback. 
And that was one of the reasons why the DEA, the Department of Economic Affairs, almost on a daily basis had to come and respond to some of the uh, messages that we were sending from different parts of the country saying, would you do this please? Would you redress this little bit of a, a difficulty and so on? So through the 50 days, you had the DEA coming out and speaking every day to respond to those calls which we heard on the ground. But even as we were sending these messages, I'm absolutely shocked and I, I pay my respects to all the Indian citizens who put up with this hardship with such a grace. You were right, absolutely graceful conduct. There wasn't any bitterness. If anything, I can say that we drew a lot of motivation from it by a common citizen telling you, we understand why you're doing this. So I would take that as an endorsement to the fact that there is a great amount of popular will to crack down on corruption and to crack down on black money. And that is where the next part of the chapter, because this is a one-time exercise and we will debate how much of a positive benefit it's given on cracking down on black money already. What happens in the future is going to be perhaps even more interesting, which we will come to. And you do therefore have popular mandate and popular support for steps that you will take against corruption and against black money. But if I could just come to you and you know, looking at what's been happening in India from the point of view of Argentina, and as the governor of the Central Bank of Argentina being tempted to do something very similar, what would you do similar to this and what would you not do? And why do you think this has not been, a, that, why are you tempted to do something like this? Well, I'm not here to give any advice. I'm just here to share our experience because uh, we've been thinking about this issue for a while. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article in Argentina saying that we had to phase out the high denomination bills. Okay? Created quite a bit of a stir. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic to this. Uh, and I also admire the boldness and the stamina, I think you said, Minister, to carry through this, these policies. Why is this an important issue in Argentina? The first one is because we want to bring people into the formal economy. And for that, that has to do with fairness, which is something that the minister already talked about. Because we have a system where only a few pay taxes, and they have to pay very high taxes. And you really want a system where everybody pays lower taxes, and that would be a fair system. So for us, it's fairness what's behind uh, this. A second concern, which I don't know if it's relevant in India or not, but it's very relevant in Argentina, is security. Yes. So we have kind of robberies, and you have people which go around with cash, and they get mugged because they have cash. So if you actually take that cash away, then you have that disappear. And we also think that there's an efficiency gain to have the means of payments being done in an electronic manner. So there are three very important reasons to which we could add a fourth, which is that the cost of printing money, maybe people don't know this, because people take it for granted. They receive the bills, they go to the bank, they use the bills, but someone has to print those bills. Someone has to get those bills to them. And this is a tremendous cost for the economy. It's actually very expensive. So, so basically, we had this, this idea that uh, we needed to phase out cash for these four reasons. Uh, actually, there's a puzzle because we're so accustomed to use cash that nobody charges for cash. So in fact, the current system subsidizes cash. It's not, so it, it's not that we, we're not kind of phasing out cash. We're, right Today, we're subsidizing cash. So we really want to get away from that. Now, in Argentina, we had an experience about three years ago where we said that from that, and it was very quick, very much like in India, but it was, it was done for pay, paying the buses, the transportation system. So the transportation system was not going to use coins anymore. You would have to get a card and you would be able to pay with a card. And that was tremendously successful. In fact, we phased out the demand for coins. For example, the central bank, I have barrels and barrels and barrels of minted coins that nobody wants because people don't use coins anymore. And people took this and this eased their lives and it they saved a, a tremendous amount of costs. It was a very successful experience. In the case of bills, we've decided to do a different strategy. So let me tell you what we're doing because we're kind of in a different process but in the middle of the road. First of all, we decided we were going to provide an alternative to cash. The first thing we were going to do is prepare a digital alternative to cash. So we asked the banks to provide a network for transactions which are called direct transfers, where people can transfer money from one bank account to another account over their cell phones. 
And these networks came in operation. They have to be interoperable, meaning that you can actually hook up to the network regardless of what bank you have your bank account in. I, again, I don't know if this is similar to, to India, but in Argentina you can do this because cell phone penetration is very high and smartphone penetration is very high. So you actually have the technological platform in order to do that. So our first step was basically to provide a, a basically an equivalent alternative to cash, but in the digital world. And those networks started operating in Argentina the 15th of December of last year. So it's just, just right there. Now the second step is how do we push people to operate into the digital world? Because you can open up the accounts or you can have this mechanism, but if people don't use it, you haven't done anything at the end of the day. So here's where we've taken the idea of Sweden. One day I was talking with the president of the Central Bank of Sweden. You know, in Sweden, only 6% of transactions are done with cash. 94% of transactions are done in the digital world. And then he said, how did I get people to move to the digital world? He said, I had a lot of troubles convincing the Swedes. You know, the Swedes typically are farmers, we're very conservative, and they love cash. So how do you push them to go to cash? And he said, well, I go back to this idea that cash was free. Why is cash free? I'm going to charge banks when they want to use cash. So he started charging banks for using cash, and the banks themselves did the work of basically taking people to the digital world. Because for them, it was costly to use cash. So what we're doing in Argentina, and I finish with this, basically what, we're the, what we call phase two. Phase one was to have in the platform. Phase two is we stop receiving cash from the banks. So now the banks have their vaults full of cash. They don't know. They can't use it as reserve requirement. It's a cost for them. So this is the incentives we're providing to uh, have them move people to the digital world. We've opened up a market for cash, an electronic market for cash. So if one bank has a supply of a cash and uh, another yeah. bank has a lower, they will trade between them and the central bank will not intervene anymore. But that will make them more cumbersome to work so, with cash. And the last phase, and with this it finishes, we'll charge bank for the cash. And we hope that with that we'll kind of seamlessly kind of move people to the digital world. So your, your plan does not ever involve doing like what was done, which is just to say, okay, it's, it's banned. High denomination notes are banned. You can't use them as legal tender. You didn't consider doing that. Now, for example, uh, I, we are not uh, keen on surprising people. For us, I mean, the, the, I mean, the problem for uh, the real, no, I mean, the real problem for us is, was not so much the stock. It was really moving the economy to a new kind of way of doing transaction. So we thought perhaps it was much better to kind of make sure, and of course India will be successful because the example I gave of our card for, so it will be successful. But we thought our focus was on how do we move the economy to a more formal economy, and we were not so much concerned with the current stock. I, I think I understood from the minister that for them it was a very important, it is a very valid, valid concern yeah, as well. Nimachi, I mean, some of those examples, and I'm sure you'll, you must have been studying other examples like this elsewhere, which did not quite involve that short-term pain that the surprise element had, which is to just say, okay, from tonight, you can't use it anymore. That has a surprise element. And that has a, the reason for that surprise element is that one-time strike on the stock of black money, not on the generation of black money, not on the flow of black money, not even on moving people to digital ways of payment, because you can do that through other methods, as was just suggested. The only reason to have that surprise attack was a one-time strike on the stock of black money. With all these months having gone by and the data are there, how successful do you think that strike was? Because we still, from whatever we are hearing, a lot of that money has now come back into the system. So it's possible that that stock of black money ended up getting laundered, in which case, I think question itself. Sorry. Assume that that's the argument. In now, bank. And when they want to bank, it means they are now going to be available. So that is one thing. And therefore, there is no distinction between attacking only the stock and not thinking about the flow. Both are being targeted, 
the moment the money has come into the banks, it means there is a possibility. Now you can think in terms of what is going on. You, it is no more anonymous. It has to be identified. With, so that's one thing. The second thing is, Argentina's is, is probably based on some other background realities. In India, the question of holding cash, unaccounted cash, what we call black money, is a major issue. We could not have little by little absorbed the 500,000 over several years and waited for the impact to uh, you know, bear it on itself on the economy. So obviously, you had to look at not just drawing 500,000 over a five-year period, but to make sure that that is hit at. You were talking about Argentina having about 5 to 6 percent of cash, whereas the, whereas the international average, the average is about 7 percent, cash to GDP. I was just, uh, I was just going to okay. make just going that Argentina, Argentina is a light cash country. Yeah. That's right. Uh, That's right. So the background is completely different. And now, the point that Argentina is making, and which sounds very convincing, is the kind of trajectory that we are taking also. We are going in for mobile transaction, mobile-based transactions. And India has great mobile penetration, not smartphone. Uh, we are yes, there is some section of smartphone users, but they are not very many. The other phone is what is dominating. Every mic seems to have for some reason. <laughs> so even those who do not have a smartphone. Give us a second. Okay, let's pause for a minute while we can fix this. Is the mic problem or is there something at that end? I think both mics are on. So yeah, this is fine now. Is that fine now? Should I continue? Yeah. Good? Okay, great. So I think we even for those who are not having smartphones, the mobile app that we've come up with called Bheem, Bharat Interface for Money, is really so popular. And the USSD transactions, which don't depend on internet availability, it doesn't depend on a smartphone. It can be done anywhere through simple SMS texting. But not many people That's, are using it right now. It's about 5,000 transactions a day when we last got the data. Well, how many days after demonetization are you talking about? If you, it can't really reach Indians within two days to prove that, oh my God, this is what success is. The success is people are ready to adopt it. And um, if I don't sound cynical, I've found many of us sitting in Delhi or Mumbai hesitating to see, oh, have I got to use my phone by, by using my biometric? I'm okay with my card. Whereas my shopkeeper in my village or the vegetable vendor in the village who sits on a pavement and sells, says, Madam, whatever it is, you can do this QR. Put your phone, show the QR, you get my payment. Okay. No, I, Pedro, you were trying, is yeah. faster among them than with Before this. I get common in, you want no, to I wanted something? to say, don't misunderstand me. I think that going after the stock, the stock is a very valid objective. And as Ken was saying, Argentina comes from many years of high inflation, so our cash is 1% of GDP. That's why for us, the stock was not that an, a so relevant right. issue as opposed to kind of move into the digital. So I think yeah. given those different circumstances, you can understand. Yeah, every, every country has their own approaches. circumstances. I mean, we, we've heard lots of the arguments, you know, pro and con. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to get you know, your expert view on before we move on to what should be done for the future. Your take on a lot of what's happened so far. Um, so I concur with the view that it's short-run pain and long-run gain. I think the signaling that we are becoming serious about a, playing the big league with an integrated economy, reducing the underground economy, re reducing illegal transactions, I, I think I, a good characterization is indeed short-run pain, long-run gain. Now, I'd like to put two things on the table. One was when in November, I, like everyone else, was surprised by the move. Uh, I tried to see, are there comparable experiments? 
Uh, and if you look at the historical examples uh, of currency conversions, you could find basically three different types. One was a fairly moderate approach. Ken has written about this. Canada facing out the $1,000 bill or Singapore doing away with a $10,000 uh, bill. But these are small compared to India's 86% of the outstanding stock of currency. Uh, the second type of experiment is currency changes that usually, and Ken and I have written about this, they're, they're, you can look at them in, by the dozen. And these typically come after high inflation, in which you have wholesale currency conversions. I believe Brazil may hold the record. They had four currency conversions in less than 10 years. No, no, I think, I think no, no, I don't take issue, but I think Brazil still wins. Uh, <laughs> but but the, the, the main critical difference, and, uh, and Federico has uh, mentioned this and, and, and can have, is that after a high or a hyperinflation, nobody's using currency, whether it's legal or not. The, the whole issue that India has faced that Currency is such an ingrained part of rural transactions, small businesses, and indeed entire industries. That, after a hyperinflation or a high or a long period of high inflation, you don't worry about that. People have either moved to dollars or some other currency, uh, or you know, uh, perhaps. Uh, indexation, or they have found alternatives to currency. Now, the third example is the closest thing to India, only in intent, not in magnitude. And this is what the military bases, I know this sounds far-fetched, but just bear with me. The military bases, in, in US military bases in World War II during Vietnam would, upon surprise, change military certificates, change the color. Why? Because they knew those military certificates, which were not legally used outside to try to shield the economy, were being, uh, soldiers were paying with these military certificates in bars and in all kinds of places. And so there was a very active black market. And they would abruptly change them to uh, kill the black market. Um, you know those, uh, episodes were successful because usually the bases would be attacked afterwards as the locals retaliated for the capital losses that, that. Uh, w so where does this leave the India example? I, I have to say this time is different. This time is really different. Uh, and well, I can say that because in terms of the scale um, and the uh, uh, impact, potential impact on economic activity. Now, let me just add one more thing. Um, I still have a pet peeve on how it was conducted. This is strictly in the backward looking. And it has, I think the issues here have been discussed by experts on the issue of whether currency uh, should have been, you know, ready, or to what extent was a surprise, a total surprise, a good idea. The, but my pet peeve is India is also undertaking another extremely bold initiative, the GST, the introduction of the GST, which I think will deal also with the problem of flow. This is the the. Yeah. Uh, it's broadening the tax base, it's closing loopholes, it's getting at segments of the economy that have never paid taxes. I would have preferred the GST to be introduced before rather than after the currency conversion because I think... Uh, you think that it might hold up the introduction or the implementation of GST? That is what I... We've that's had what, some opposition that leaders saying me. that. And it also concerns me that some of the snags with the demonetization may be you know, connected to the GST in a way that 
they may have no connection. That's my pet. Okay, push GST first. I just want to get any, before I come back to the and, uh, and then move on to, to the flow part of it. Your sense, any of you, your sense of how effective a strike this is going to have been on the stock of black money. You are, I'm sure, hearing the same stories. And I know Nirmaji said that, in a sense, it has been tagged. It's back in the banking system. Sooner or later, those who laundered their black money will be found and will be identified. So therefore, that, that stock aspect of it, which is the only reason to have done it in this surprise manner, will eventually uh, come to life. Are you as sanguine as that? or? Are you doubtful? Well, there are certain implementation issues still because you can understand with so much of uh, stuff having happened and uh, with the kind of numbers of people that we have in our country and the number of accounts that may have been used to study all of this and to come up with the right kind of questions to the people who need to be asked them is actually a humongous task. Of course, technology is going to be used in order to understand the patterns and stuff like that. But even then, it is a humongous task. The second yeah. thing, I think, which will actually uh, you know, tell us whether this is going to be a success or not, is what happens going forward and how much of digital is actually, um, uh, actually uh, used by people for doing their transactions henceforth. Uh, I can tell you that, if, say, just for cards, we were doing about 950 million uh, rupees worth of transactions per day before the demonetization. Today per day, we are doing uh, 3.9 billion. So we have gone up four times in this space of 60 days, the card transactions. However, the moment the, the withdrawal limit in the ATMs went up to 10,000 rupees, the very next day, the number of card transactions, the amount of card transactions came down. So, you know, you have to make a lot of efforts to ensure that people don't slide back into their old ways of doing business. And things like GST actually come in very quickly in order to plug the uh, loopholes so that people actually are enthused or pushed and incentivized to actually remain in the uh, white economy. Ken Rogoff, the only reason to do it the Government of India way as opposed to the Ken Rogoff way would be that strike on the, on the stock of black money. You think it's been effective? Well, in, in short, probably not. That I think they had a weak hand because not they didn't want to have chaos and they realized that problems, they couldn't uh, really be that strict. The numbers are big. But I want to underscore something Carmen uh, said, which is it's a long run thing. It's a question of the follow up. And have you changed the, Carmen said, this may change the mindset, a wake up call. Do you have to be careful if you're using cash? But then you have to follow it up in other ways. Uh, and, and there are many examples across the world, for example, putting limits on the size of cash transactions, changing other reporting requirements. <laughs> At least with major department stores or larger stores, you can require them to put black boxes and wire their cash registers, which is done in a number of countries, including Sweden now. Right. Did you ever consider, to, taking Carmen's point forward, waiting for GST or, you know, saying that the phasing should be done? Or were you, are you reasonably confident both these big bang steps can be taken simultaneously? Well, the GST <coughs> is going through a process now and we hope to um, conclude the discussions so that it can be rolled out from 1st July. But you saw and everybody saw the way in which the negotiations or discussions with the states were going on. The GST Council got formed after the constitutional <coughs> amendment itself. So there was a, a trajectory that this whole debate of the GST was taking on its own in the sense it was becoming more political dialogue. Whereas the mandate with which we've come, we've got five years within which we have to show maximum intent to curtail black money. So we, there was no choice. You wouldn't put GST before or after. GST depended on so many provinces agreeing with you. So many ministers from the states agreeing with the details of what went into GST. So um, to even have a calculus that the GST first, then this, wouldn't be fitting into the framework of things as to how GST gets negotiated and how the uh, demonetization, which had to happen. So there was no choosing between the two in terms right. of time. Right. If I can now move to the basic <coughs> 
core question of future suppression of corruption and preventing further black money. There are two possible ways of doing this, and you know the government has referred to both aspects of this in the last few weeks. One is to say, yes, our tax department is going to go after people who are laundering money. There's going to be you know, lots of vigilance, and officials are going to do it, which is fine. That probably needs to be done. All these records need to be studied. But going forward, to, in, to expect that tax inspectors or Inspector Raj or people are going to be able to monitor and check and figure out you know, where who's corrupt and where the black money is coming from, probably not going to work because many of those people are the very same people who are the cause of corruption in the first place. So the minute you give any inspectors, any government officials full power to go out and check who's making money, you can be, almost be certain that it's an invitation for them to make money themselves. Uh, and that is why maybe something else is required, better systems, streamlined systems. What is the government's thought process in this? Well, I think partly Ms. Um, Bhattacharya very clearly said about it. It is not to go back to the days when the income tax commissioners or his staff would be going and visiting people and say, we suspect something is wrong with you. There is an immense technological capability which is now in place. Without human interface, it can go by a certain pattern, certain flow, your average uh, you know, uh, deposits in the bank, yearly average, and so on, has its own matrix, and then randomly picks on people where some entries have been noticed which are unusual, based on which the question is going to be asked of people to explain for themselves, first of all, as to what is happening. So it is not as if somebody is going to knock at your door and ask you questions. The system is going to highlight those who have to be contacted. They are going to be asked questions. They are going to respond to it, probably through email, probably through whatever, through their chartered accountants. And it is only after that, if there is a need, they are going to be asked to explain it before a commissioner. So the, uh, I think the narrative is now moved over to, depending on technology, minimum human interface, and therefore, going back to a system of Inspector Raj doesn't arise at all. Okay, that's probably something that Davos would be particularly delighted to hear. Use technology, use artificial intelligence, and no Inspector Raj. That's the theme of, of this year, literally. Uh, very much fourth industrial revolution, if you know what I mean. Um, just looking at, the, at that, that theory, and I'm going to come back in reverse direction. What would be the steps and the best way if India is to transform and to say, look, we're going to be cracking down on black money, this entire system of number two money, illegal money, black money, corruption, this is going to be a decisive war on all of that. What were the steps you would take going forward? You're asking me. I'm starting with you, yes. Okay. Uh, there's a number of things, and one, and, and much of which is already, as I said, connected to the GST, I think, the broadening of the tax base, getting to pockets uh, that were completely underground economy, have never been anything other than underground economy, is extremely important because India is moving and keeps ratcheting up in its world position. And so the idea of relying on tariffs or relying on the financial repression tax or other forms of taxation that are not longer seen as attractive is, is Filling in those holes is extremely important. Secondly, I would have to say is, what are the alternatives? I mean, monitoring gold. I mean, are the, 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 is, is gold going to be another source, uh, an alternative to uh, cash? Uh, then there is an area, a nebulous area of Bitcoin. I mean, we have seen in periods of, for example, in China, and in Greece, in periods of extreme stress, that capital flight uh, has really ramped up activity in Bitcoin. So what I'm yeah. making is the generalized point that monitoring what alternatives could so be So monitor out the alternatives and see where else that black money and, and, and really proceeds of corruption. And really going for the... For, for the implementation of the GST. Lessons uh, that you perhaps have learned because Argentina and many other countries in Latin America have also been fighting those similar wars against corruption and black money. What's, what's worked? I, I go back to the example of our card for transportation. It was very successful. But why, it was, why was it successful? Because it was so convenient that people embraced it willingly. 
In, uh, back in 2001, we had a fixed exchange rate regime and the uh, money left Argentina, so we had a huge monetary contraction, and actually people started creating their own money. So if you don't create, and if you take money out of the system and you don't create a system by which people can do transactions, the idea of people creating their own money is not just a fantasy, it has happened. In Argentina, it has happened. So, so I think this is, I would say this is a very important thing. You won't solve it legally. For example, in Argentina, we have restrictions. You can't do with cash, you cannot do with cash transactions above a certain amount, but it's impossible to enforce that, absolutely impossible. So I think, again, the focus in our case, in our ex experience, is to build a digital way of doing payments which is better than the physical cash. I'll just give you two examples of things of how fast things are moving. In, I told you in December 15, we started having this interoperable network of digital payments. At the same time, we basically forced the bank to offer their clients something which is called an m -pos. It's a dongle. It's something that you hook into your cell phone and then you can pass the credit card. Well, that already, two months later, that's obsolete. Now, the way you do the payment is that you have the grocery store or the cab driver or whoever to print on a printer a QR code and you basically take a phone, a photo of the QR phone, and then the money goes directly. You don't need a, you don't need a, a machine. You don't need a connection. The seller needs nothing. Just needs a piece of paper with a picture, and he gets the money or she gets the money. Well, I'm seeing, I'm seeing Amitabh Khan, you know, here, here in the audience. He'll probably tell you some of what India is trying may make all of that obsolete. Yeah. Actually, if you can get a mic to him, um, uh, the perfect time to perhaps get get you in, Amitabh. What India is trying now with biometrics and thumb scans, does it go even further than that? Well, India is uh, on the cusp of a very, very major technological revolution, uh, which will make everything irrelevant. And, uh, because you will just use your thumb or your iris uh, to transact all uh, debit and credit. And uh, this has not happened anywhere else in the world because 110 million Indians have biometric today. And this will, by 2020, to my mind, make all debit card, credit card, ATM, all dongles, all ATMs, posh machines, all redundant, totally redundant. And India will really set the trend of technological leapfrogging across the world. By 2020, so that's only three years away, Yes. You actually think there'll be enough biometric sensors out there that that is becomes the dominant method of payment in India? So, uh, actually, every a single uh, mobile will have uh, your either your thumb or your iris, and uh, so each one of us uh, in India will be a walking ATM. We will all be transacting through that mobile, and uh, you know this will this will probably be the biggest technological leapfrogging ever in the. History of mankind. <laughs> wow, that's that sounds. Uh, and you're going to be having to, imp, imp, you know, implement some of that as no, the no, largest no, no, bank no. in India. We are how, already. How realistic is that? That's very realistic, and I think it wasn't 110 million, so it's 1.1 billion. Yeah, 1.1 billion. 1.1 billion people already have their biometrics on Aadhaar, and uh, the, as a result of that, this is something that's eminently doable. The dongle for scanning your fingerprints comes at a paltry 2,000 rupees. And if you buy in bulk, that price will go down further. So you just add it to your smartphone and you have something which can do all transactions. Okay, so let me so, put you on the spot right now. If you had to be, and you must be doing forward predictions for the State Bank of India and others and saying, you know, in 2020, 2021, are all of our branches, our ATMs, our cash machines, is all of that almost redundant? And should we be basing ourselves on those Amitabh's you know, no, you uh, biometric sensors? You have to understand sensors. that this is merely the payment system that we are talking about. Right. Banking goes way beyond payment system. Right. So yes. to that extent, you know, you cannot replace banks. But obviously what banks need to do is to digitize processes very, very quickly, which we are doing. And we are at the cutting edge of all of this. So we are very much a player in all of these things. I told you regarding the card transactions, how they had quadrupled over this period of time. At the same period of time, our mobile wallets, which used to do transactions of 10 million per day, is currently doing 70 million per day. So, you know, all of this is going very, very quickly. And we are now on the UPI, where you can do your transactions merely if you have the phone number. You don't need a bank account number. You don't okay. need the bank number, nothing. See, there are two other things, or rather three other things that I really want to talk about in demonetization. Over and above the bringing into the tax net, 
those who are avoiding taxes, tax avoidance, mm -hmm. there are three other very distinct benefits. One, of course, is that today the liquidity in the banking system has gone up hugely. Now, as a result of that, what has happened is in a space of 60 days, the bank interest rate has fallen by more than 100 basis points. In a country that is plagued with high interest rates, that's saying a lot. So it has brought in a huge amount of lendable resources into the bank. Okay. The second thing that is there is the push of digitization. What we have done in digitization in 60 days, I have not done in the past three years. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing like, you know, an emergency to bring out the best in you, where innovation is considered, where adoption of something new is considered. Okay. And the last thing I want to say is that financial inclusion, which started with the opening of accounts, that has really been pushed a lot. I was just recently in one of the tea gardens in Assam. There, the tea garden workers get paid every week. For the last 200 years, they have been paid by in cash every week. For the first time this time, we opened all of their accounts. And one person from media, in fact, was telling me that would you say that for the first time, freedom has come to these workers after 200 years. So there is definitely a push right. towards financial inclusion. Well, you know, one example of how fast everything is moving digital. So we do have Chandrajit Banerjee, the head of CIA, sitting right here in the audience, the but has preferred to send preferred to send send his question here on the iPad. So uh, an <laughs> uh, interesting it's question. Up there. Yeah, it's up there. So, you know, okay, we, we will rely on digital, uh, you know, oh, actually ask the question. You, you got on the mic now. I, I just... Uh, so I got my attention digitally, <laughs> will allow you to ask it in the old-fashioned manner. <laughs> no, I just posted it. But uh, two issues, actually. One, the informal sector has been playing a very, very important role in the economy in India. And... Well, while digit, uh, uh, demonetization is going to bring in a lot of efficiency into the system, how do we deal with this current situation that the informal sector is going to play? And the second is, a lot of money has actually, all the black money, a lot of black money has come into the, into the banking system. How do we ensure that, again, does not get back into, in, 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 into, into the black economy once again. Imagine, so that's a round tripping of a different manner, that it's gone into the banking system, but it's back out now again as black money, and we keep hearing these anecdotal stories of raids being conducted and you know, people being found with large stacks, you know, uh, stacks of the new 2,000 rupee notes. That's one issue, where the new 2,000 rupee notes had to go to the people, it hadn't. And uh, some uh, black sheep in the banks have siphoned it off. And the government is after them, we are going to get that back. But the question of money which has come into the banks, not all of it is white, not all of it is going to go without being, questions being asked. And if it doesn't add up in terms of uh, reconciling with your accounts, it is definitely going to be declared black money. And the quantum which hasn't come is definitely still out there as invalid currency anymore. Uh, so the question is not about, oh, all money has come into the bank, so where is your uh, black money? Because everything that has come into the bank is still not assumed to be clean and white. As regards the informal economy, I think it is important now with the GST also coming in, no transaction is just going to be left without. If you want the uh, credits from the GST transaction, it has to be on board. It has to move from one point to another digitally. There's no human interface again there too. The credits are going to be given online. Your payment will be done online. And it is just one payment. You're not going to be paying taxes to five different authorities. So with all this happening, I think uh, with the demonetization, with the informal economy being where it is, with the GST, even this is going to come on board. And therefore, I think we are talking about several things all at one go. And the major enabler in this is the digitized approach using technology. All right, let me get a, um, we are almost out of time now. I'm going to get a couple of quick questions. Uh, Adar Poonawala had a question, so. Adar Poonawala from the biotech sector in India. Uh, I'm sure the demonetization will have its long-term benefits, but um, a, a very important uh, point uh, that both domestic investors and foreign investors are concerned about India, and we feel it's far more uh, important than even these issues that we've discussed about, and that's ease of doing business in India. Today, you talked about Vikram corruption going down. We feel that uh, unless we're able to do away with these 20, 30 permissions that you need to start a factory or a plant or a business, um, you know, once we get toward a single window type of clearance and all those reforms that uh, Amitabh ji has uh, done already a lot in India and we're looking forward to 
achieving, I think that will really truly bring down corruption once we do away with those areas. So My the, question would be in this is, uh, uh, can you may perhaps shed some light on um, what has been the progress in that area and uh, what can we see going forward in this area? Because that'll, you know, it's all related to then uh, jobs, investment, uh, the business uh, thriving and India reaching its full potential. All right, um, Mr. Jakar has a one quick last question and then I'll, I'll, I'll have to wrap up. I think we're out of time. So I, I, I request all the three non-Indians to, you know, give their perspective on basic income transfers if that is going to transform India. That, that, that's a question that okay. Indians want. And see, ma'am, uh, this is regarding the banking sector. You say interest rates will come down, but millions and millions of farmers have fixed deposit accounts and their income goes down. This is what India is asking because economists want interest rates to come down for loans while the depositors want interest rates to remain high for their saving bank deposits. So can you please clarify on that? Okay, I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'm just going to come back to get uh, Kendra. Just throwing that question that I started by asking, prevention of black money and corruption for the future. And I think Adit Punawala touched on one of the aspects of it. The easier it, it is to do business, the less complication you have, the less human intervention and discretion that there is, Potentially, that is the single most powerful weapon that ex exists to crack down on corruption and black money going forward. Well, would, absolutely. A, would you um, agree with that? And B, what else would you say? I mean, I think the reason that there's so many forms required is the officials want to collect bribes along the way. I mean, that's been the classic interpretation. And digitizing, putting it online, as the Modi administration did early on. I just want, want to say, I mean, there are many dimensions to cracking down on the black economy and energizing the whole populace to think about this as good. Cash is important. You can look at the advanced economies, which are in a different place. Uh, the, even in places like Germany, the level of uh, you know, digital transactions is growing, growing. Cash is declining in the legal economy, but the demand for cash is exploding because of the underground economy. You see this dramatically in the advanced economies. I think it's right to identify cash as particular. Bitcoin is just not a substitute for cash because it's not legal in all the same places. So it, it was right to try to address this. All right, uh, Nimaji, I'm, we are out of time, but one final quick word on you. So I think that one of the basic lessons looking forward that is coming out uh, and taking again others' point is just the more you simplify, the more easy it is to do business, the fewer permissions you need, forms you have to fill, licenses you need to get, people coming and bugging you, the, the more, that will be the, probably the single most decisive blow you can do on black money and corruption. There's no doubt, and we are at it. In fact, uh, almost on an everyday basis, we are uh, releasing um, the progress in this work. Where you required eight, now you require one, and you don't do uh, on paper, you can do it from where you are digitally and so on. It just doesn't stop uh, with just the central government. We are working with the state governments. We have even gone down one layer to the local authorities who actually issue the permits at the ground. So the work on ease of doing business is ongoing. And with customs at the port, we have man uh, we've, we've clearly concluded having a single window portal through which your uh, phytosanitary inspectors, your customs officials, whoever has to be there to certify any export or you know, check any imports are all falling in place. It's an ongoing work. I don't think it's going to finish just yet, but it is happening. All right, we look forward to that process going forward. Ease of business, cut red tape, give 1.1 billion Indians biometric sensors through which they can pay. And if all of that does happen in the next three years, India will have transformed. I think that's something which we can all agree on. Thank you all so much for having joined us. And that was the NDTV WEF debate 2017. Thanks for having me.